Hi, this is your host Sapin Bharatiya and uh, welcome to another episode of TFR Newsroom. StackRox is announcing its very first open source project ahead of KubeCon North America 2020. It's called KubeLinter, which helps Kubernetes users identify misconfigurations. To talk about the project we have with us, Viswajit Benagopal, lead developer of the project and software engineer at StackRox. Viswa, first of all, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sapnil. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I remember uh, talking to Ali Golsham, uh, I think it's been a year now, when I talked about, you know, the open source story at Stack Rocks, and he was like, you know, just just wait, you know, we will have something to tell. But it was not ready at back in those days. So it's good to see uh, open source coming out of Stack Rocks. So tell me, uh, what inspired or what led you to create this project? What problem that you saw in the ecosystem that you tried to solve? I think this is a problem that, started out very personal for us because it's a problem that we ourselves experience internally because our own product deploys in Kubernetes clusters. And one thing that we've struggled with is figuring out when we create a new service, which we're doing all the time in Kubernetes with all these different applications and microservices. When we create a new service, we there are a lot of knobs and dials that you have to turn uh, that you can con- to make sure that something uh, is running with least privilege or that something is running in a way that's production ready. And if you just configure the applications until until you reach a point where the application is running in the cluster, most of the time, that's not actually enough for you to be confident that you can deploy it to production. And a lot of the checks can actually be automated. Uh, They're simple uh, thing. It's almost like a list of uh, check boxes that you have to make sure that you're following, a list of best practices that you're able to follow. And we were finding ourselves as developers taking on a lot of that burden of making sure that our applications were uh, like satisfying these checks, of making sure, of trying to catch these in code review. And the idea of Kubelinter really came from what if we try to ex- take all this work that we do and shift it to a tool that can do these checks. Uh, so that's where the idea for Kubelinter came from. Uh, we And we saw it as a gap in the ecosystem because none, none of the existing tools uh, quite satisfied uh, the use cases that, that we had. And so we saw it as an opportunity to not only build something for our internal use, but also to make it an open source tool that we were able to uh, share with the community. And hopefully the tool grows with community usage and gets enriched based on uh, experiences and learnings from people in the community. Can you tell me how exactly does it work? Basically, it's it's a simple uh, binary uh, written in Go. So uh, you can you know download it from our GitHub today and you can invoke it on the command line. Uh, and all you have to do is pass it a list of uh, directories or files uh, which contain Kubernetes YAML files uh, or Helm charts, which is the other thing we support because uh, for us internally, as well as most organizations with some level of sophistication, uh, a maturity in Kubernetes, they have started storing the configurations as Helm charts. Uh, and what it does is it reads those files uh, and it passes those into Kubernetes objects. Uh, so since we do it in Go uh, and Kubernetes itself is written in Go, we're actually able to leverage a lot of the native tooling that Kubernetes internally uses. Uh, and then we have a bunch of checks, which are basically functions that run on these objects. So then, for example, one check is, uh, is your container using a read-only root file system? And the way we do that is we pass this YAML file into a deployment, which has a set of containers in its specification. And then we can go over each container and check, uh, does this have a read-only root file system or not? And then if it doesn't, then we can, print a message and alert the user. And we also return an exit code so uh, so that they know, to, so that if they run it in the CI system or something, the build fails if violations are found. Right. Uh, can you also talk about why these misconfigurations are so common and also uh, so problematic in the Kubernetes space? I mean, misconfigurations are like <laughs> problematic everywhere, no matter what, where they are. So talk about it specifically in the Kubernetes space. 
Yeah, so the way I like to think about it is that this is Kubernetes' great strength is its level of flexibility, uh, right? Because you can do pretty much, you can achieve pretty much anything in Kubernetes. And this is one of the big reasons for its success. Because if you think back to five, 10 years ago, most big organizations were almost building their own orchestrator because none of the existing tools satisfied all their use cases. And what Kubernetes has managed to do is build one platform that's flexible enough to do uh, satisfy a lot of these use cases. But the downside of anything being very flexible is that there are there's a lot of different configuration options that you're going to get. Uh, and the more configuration options there are, the more scope there is for misconfiguration. So I think that's one big aspect of it, uh, which is kind of unavoidable if you want to build something uh, which is as flexible and widely adopted. Uh, the second aspect of it uh, here, focusing specifically on security, is that a lot of the defaults in Kubernetes are not geared towards security. This is partly because it's already pretty difficult to get your apps up and running with containers and getting them to talk to each other. And I think if if Kubernetes was locked down by default, it would have been even harder to for users to get started and would have hurt adoption. And so defaults are not always geared towards security for this reason. Uh, another reason is also backward compatibility. A lot of security features that we recommend as best practices today were not part of the early versions of Kubernetes. And so uh, for when they introduced these features, in order to be backward compatible, they defaulted them to uh, to false. And so because of that, it's it's harder to be sure that you're configuring things securely. So I would say those are the two big sources of the problems that we're trying to solve. As a new versions of Kubernetes come out, how will you keep up? Because you know, with new versions, things change. You know, uh, configuration is something. You know, fine tuning how you do things that will also change. So, how do you plan to keep up with that at the same time, also uh, supporting the previous releases which customers are running? Yeah. So uh, there's a couple of uh, answers to this. So one is that our technology choice makes it easy for us to keep up because. Uh, the Kubernetes, we use the Kubernetes library directly since we're written in Go. Uh, and they, uh, it has a lot of things baked in to make it possible to work across multiple versions of Kubernetes. So we can leverage that out of the box. And as new versions of Kubernetes release, we make sure, we'll make sure to like update the new libraries. Uh, the other aspect of it is, you know, it's not just going to be updating the library, but Best practices may change, uh, new configuration options may be introduced that we want to check for. Uh, and this is where, uh, since the focus of our company is uh, Kubernetes security, these are things that we are tracking anyway uh, for uh, for our commercial product, as well as uh, for to keep abreast of developments in Kubernetes. And we're always trying to figure out how to update our recommendations and best practices as new versions come out. Uh, and so we're going to take that and it's a non-trivial amount of work. Uh, we, it is manual work, but it's work that we are doing anyway. And so we're going to leverage that to enrich Kubelinter as well. Who's the ideal user for Kubelinter? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so I, I would say there are two buckets. Uh, so one is individual developers. Uh, and uh, that would be people like me uh, at StackRox uh, or my you know equivalents at other companies who have to deploy the applications into clusters and they're writing these YAML files and they it basically gives you guidance on how to do it uh, and make sure that you know you're following best practices so uh, I, and the tool is intended to be used by developers it's very easy to run on your laptop or uh, you know your uh, some virtual machine that you're SSH into or wherever uh, the second class of user is people who are uh, I would say responsible for security of clusters, whether that's a DevOps team or a security team. Uh, and the way they can leverage Kubelinter is if if the organization has a practice of treating configuration as code. So everything that goes into your cluster first makes it into uh, a repository and say GitHub or GitLab or Bitbucket and then is deployed through a CI CD system. What you can do is you can integrate Kubelinter into the into the checks, the automated checks that you have on your GitHub repository. And so you can make sure that anytime someone is updating a configuration for an app or adding a new app, 
then their configuration follows these policies that you can set. Why did you decide to open source it? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think, like you mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, we we have been looking to find a way to add value to the open source community because the I think we uh, we love the Kubernetes ecosystem and our mission is to make it possible for companies to use Kubernetes and deploy it securely. And a big part of why there's such a thriving ecosystem is open source. And so when we see when we saw a gap in the open source ecosystem, we uh, we saw it as a good opportunity for us to contribute. Uh, and secondly, from the point of view of the tool itself, right? I think we have our own opinions and uh, expertise around best practices, but this is a community that's full of very smart people who are learning all the time. And I think what we're hoping for is that as we as we see wider adoption for this tool, uh, we get suggestions from users on like what are the best practices that they use in their organization and kind of fold that into Kublinter as well. And then you have uh, which you have what is like, I think, the true strength of open source, which is a world where everyone is able to learn from everyone else's expertise. Uh, and in a way that it wouldn't in a way that wouldn't be possible if it was just uh, if it was just us you know f- figuring out what best practices everyone should follow i think that that like wisdom of the crowd is one big uh, aspect of why we decided to open source right what is the future of the project like is it going to be a stack rocks project or do, or do you plan to contribute it to some neutral foundation uh, how do you plan to engage the wider community around it can you talk about that? Yeah, so uh, we, right now, this is just uh, the, the very first release. Uh, so we, uh, our focus right now is, you know, we know it's at a very early stage. Uh, we know there are going to be uh, requests people have. We're really trying to figure out how would people use this? How, uh, what are ways we can make the tool more useful uh, and iterate? Uh, and we're trying to iterate rapidly based on that. Uh, so for the foreseeable future, we uh, we are going to keep it uh, open source under the Stackrox umbrella, but it's open source under a very permissive license, the Apache uh, 2.0 license. And I think we are going to have to evaluate down the road uh, based on how users use it, what kind of adoption we see, and uh, uh, Biswa, thank you so much for not only explaining Kubelinter, but also explaining uh, the wider problem that the, the Kubernetes community is facing and how Stack Rocks is uh, going to help them solve the problem with its own uh, very own first open source project. So once again, thank you. Thank you, Swapnil. It was really nice talking to you.